So a couple of weeks ago, Sarah and I embarked on a trip to America. It was my first time in America. And um, we had the most fabulous time. Uh, I, it's never been, I'm sorry if you're American, but it's never been somewhere that I particularly thought, oh, let's go there. But in going there, it was just the most phenomenal time. But we had a couple of moments, I'd have to say, where I felt like even though we spoke the same language, English, that somehow or other, what I was saying and what they were saying didn't quite line up. And, and so we were, one that stands out to me is we were in Dallas airport. Now, because I travel with Sarah and she's literally walking Google, I, someone had said to me, oh, be careful when you get to Dallas airport because it's really, really big. So you need to know where you're going. So Sarah then informs me that it is the third largest airport in the world, just for your information. Anyway, and so we were going to this hotel and the hotel had a free shuttle and they said, just ring us when you get there and we'll send the shuttle. And I'm like, cool. So I rang them and they were like, do you have your bags? And I'm like, no. And they're like, well, just ring us back when you got your bags. So I'm like, okay. And so I rang them back and they were giving us instructions. So are you outside? No, no, we're inside. Well, are you downstairs? I don't think so. Like, this is the first time I've ever set foot in this airport. I, I don't think so. I can see downstairs, but I can't actually work out how to get downstairs. And we were kind of hurrying because at that point we didn't realise exactly how big Dallas Airport was and how long it would take for the shuttle to get there. But, you know, Sarah and I are both diligent. We wanted to be there. We didn't want to keep anyone waiting. So I'm running along and I say to the lady on the phone, oh, oh, it's okay. Um, I found a lift. I see a lift. Okay, so this is what I see. This is what I'm going towards, right? A lift. She's like, stop. Don't get in the car. And I'm like, I'm not getting, I'm, I'm getting into the lift. No, no, we've got the shuttle. Stop. And I'm like, can you, thank you. She thought I was getting into an Uber, which is called Lyft, right? And I'm like, oh, no, no. So I had to stop and go, I was so confused. No, no, I'm getting into a elevator. And she was like, oh, I'm so glad. I thought you were getting into a car. And I was like, no, no. Anyway, she's lost in translation, right? The second time it happened to me, we were in um, Louisiana and we went, found this fabulous coffee shop. Okay, we found this fabulous cafe. <laughs> cafe. And, you know, one of the things that I encountered with my coffee order, which I think is quite simple, was that no one seemed to understand what I wanted and... Everything, everywhere called it a different thing. So I was refining my way of ordering so that my order wouldn't be lost in translation. And so this is what I was wanting. Okay, there it is. That's my coffee. So I said, okay, can I get a double shot espresso with just a little bit of milk on the side? This is what I got. And he even said, he was such a lovely young man, he even said, I gave you a straw just in case. <laughs> and I was like, in case of. <laughs> totally lost in translation. That was, and then he was horrified as he watched me try and pour a little bit of milk into my double shot espresso. And he thought I was insane. But look, just totally lost in translation, right? Have you ever felt like that? Like you're saying something in English and the person that you're saying it to is getting a totally different idea than what you're actually trying to present. I want to look at scripture this morning. We've been working through the book of Acts over the last number of weeks, months, whatever it's been. But I wanted to look at scripture this morning in Acts 14, 8 to 15, and then 17 to 18. And it's, I'm going to turn this around because I can't see it. There we go. It would be better if I saw it, right? Yeah. So, in Acts... Listeria, is that what it's called? Who's a Bible scholar? How do we say this? Lystra. Okay, thanks. That's, that'll do. In Lystra, Paul and Barnabas encountered a man who from birth had never walked, for he was crippled in his feet. He listened carefully to Paul as he preached. All of a sudden, Paul discerned that this man had faith in his heart to be healed. So he shouted, you, 
in the name of our Lord Jesus, stand on your feet. And the man instantly jumped to his feet, stood for the first time in his life and walked. When the crowd saw the miracle Paul had done, they shouted in their own language, the gods have come down to us as men. And they addressed Barnabas as Zeus and Paul as Hermes because he was the spokesman. Now outside of the city stood the temple of Zeus. The priest of the temple, in order to honour Paul and Barnabas, bought bulls with wreaths of flowers draped on them to the gates of the courtyard where they were staying. And the crowds clamoured to offer them as sacrifices to the apostles. He even brought flower, flower wreaths as crowns to place on their heads. When the apostles understood what was happening, they were mortified and tore their clothes in a sign of dismay. They rushed into the crowd and shouted, People, what are you doing? We're only weak human beings like everyone else. This is why we've come to tell you the good news, so that you would turn away from these worthless myths and turn to the living God. He is the creator of all things, the earth the heavens, the sea, and everything they contain, yet he has never left himself without clear evidence of his goodness. For he blesses us with rain from heaven and seasons of fruitful harvests, and he nourishes us with food to meet our needs. He satisfies our lives, and euphoria fills our hearts. And even after saying these things, they were barely able to restrain the people from offering sacrifices to them. I kind of feel like they went with an intention and somewhere along the line, it got lost in translation. So what's happening? Paul and Barnabas come across a man who is crippled and has never been able to walk. And upon hearing the goodness of God, Paul picks up that this man is leaning in with faith and hope that potentially he might be healed. And so they pray for him and he's healed. Just a side note on this. You know, we can gloss over Scripture sometimes. I look at this and I think that man's life changed forever. You know, in, in that time and place, being crippled, probably the only way he could earn money was to beg. He was reliant on his family and his friends to probably do everything for him. And in a moment, in an encounter with God... He is changed forever. He would have been able to work. He would have been able to provide for his family. He, his status in society would have changed. And depending on his age, he would have been able to marry and potentially have a family of his own. His whole future and his whole trajectory changed in a moment. How incredible is that? And I feel like I read that and I thought, you know, I look at my life and that's been my experience. No, I wasn't crippled and couldn't walk, but I had plenty of things that needed healing in my own life emotionally. And, and when I encountered Jesus, things began to change in an instant. And my life and my trajectory in life was changed dramatically. Was that your experience? I hope it was. What happens next is where I want to land this morning. Okay, so the people are so amazed that they shout to each other in their own language. So obviously to this point, they've been able to understand and are speaking in a way that Paul and Barnabas can understand. But they begin to shout to each other in their own language. The gods have come down to us as men and they begin to respond in the way that they would had they encountered their own God. And that is sacrifice and offerings. They're bringing these bulls and they put flowers on them and they're ready to like sacrifice them in the courtyard, which I imagine would be very, very messy. And, you know, they're making flower crowns. And when Paul and Barnabas realise what's going on and realise that their intent has been lost in translation, they, they're kind of horrified. They're kind of horrified because they'd come with the intent to simply be a reflection of Jesus in their lives, to give people the opportunity at a life earmarked by the goodness of God. The last part of that verse we read before, he is the creator of all things, the earth, the heavens, the sea, and everything they contain. And I love this bit. Yet he has never left himself without clear evidence of his goodness. There is clear evidence of God's goodness wherever you see God. 
There is clear evidence of His goodness in your life if you know Him. There is clear evidence of His goodness no matter what your journey is, no matter where you're at in life, there is clear evidence. It says He has never left Himself without clear evidence of His goodness. For he blesses us with rain from heaven and seasons of fruitful harvests, harvests, harvests. What does that mean? He provides for us. He brings rain when we need it. He brings whatever is needed in the season. He nourishes us with food to meet our needs. He satisfies our lives and euphoria fills our heart. How did this message become lost in translation? How? How did it become lost? I mean, to be fair, they were at some point, speaking a different language, but they had been understanding each other right up to this point, and then everything gets lost in translation. And I wanted to look at that in our lives this morning, because I think sometimes there are areas in our lives where we lose God in the translation. So I want to look at this morning how we lose God in in how the translation is lost in how we see God. It can get lost in translation. This is definitely what happened in Acts. They saw what was happening. They loved what was happening, but they put it in the framework that they were used to, which was their gods, which was sacrifice, which was, you know, offerings, which was I must do to, to please. They didn't put it in the framework of, God is good and He does good all the time and there is nothing that does not give evidence of His goodness. So how we see God, and I, you know, like I can see this in my own life. How we see God can be affected by our experience, can be, or what we hear or assume about Him from others. You know, when, when you first make a, a, a step and a, on your journey to follow Jesus, if you've got someone around you that is negative or says, you know, you have to work hard, it's all about working hard, it's all about earning God's love, well then your translation of God is, I must work hard. I must do to get. I must give to get. But if you have someone who is translating to you, God is good and He will walk with you and He loves you and He accepts you and it doesn't matter if you stumble and fall, He's going to be there to pick you up, then your translation is very different. Have you ever had a friend speak badly about someone you've never met and then you meet them and if this is a good friend and they don't like this person, you're kind of a little bit tainted, aren't you? No matter how nice that person is to you in the moment, you're kind of like, yeah, yeah. But I know what you're really like because my friend has translated you to me and I know that you're not a good person. And it can really cloud the way that we see and judge people we come across. Uh, have you ever, I know, I know this is just me, but you know, let's just pretend it might be one or two of you. Have you ever formed an opinion about someone from what you've seen from afar, having never actually met them. I mean, I have, I'm pretty ashamed about this. And I think sometimes I continue to do it. And I really, really try to not. But I had a, a friend, I have a friend, who I had observed at, a, at conferences for many, many years. And she was, she is, she is amazing. She's very stylish. She's probably, I would have, when I looked at her and please don't judge me as I judged her. When I looked at her, I was like, you know, she's so well-dressed, she's tall, she's blonde, she's beautiful, she drives a Porsche. You know, I'm like, I don't think we'd have anything in common. And I had written her off as someone that I would at all be interested in getting to know. That is really bad. And so please hear my confession this morning. However, I found myself at another conference in a, in a green room with just her. And I was like, great. And, you know, here she is, this icon of style and poise. And here I was, I had decided on the day, for some unknown reason, to wear a fluoro pink mini dress, which, you know, any of you that know me know that I do not 
Anyway, I wasn't feeling overly comfortable with what I was dressed in anyway, and then I'm in the green room with this icon of style and beauty that I clearly had nothing in common with. And you know what? We chatted for about 10 minutes and I found her to be entirely different <laughs> to what I had assumed she was. And we've been good friends ever since. And if not for meeting her, I think I would have not had a friendship with someone. It would have been lost in my translation, which was totally incorrect, of someone who was actually the most generous and fun, quirky, down-to-earth truck driver's daughter um, that I've ever met. But, you know, I had to go, the, the reason why I judged that, the smallness that I felt, it wasn't her. The smallness that I felt actually came from within me, not within her. And that's, you find that verse in 2 Corinthians 6, 12, and it goes on to say, your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. So you're translating the greatness and the vastness of God. Sometimes we try and translate this greatness, this vastness, this goodness into our very, very limited understanding. So I've learned that you can't base your opinion on someone else's translation. It's foolishness to do that. And it's the same with how we see God. The God that Paul and Barnabas describe in Acts 14 doesn't require the sacrifice that the people think is necessary. He doesn't. He's good. He's a provider. He meets needs. He heals. He satisfies. He brings joy. And to be honest, that should be the translation of God that we're encountering every day in our lives. So how do we ensure that the way we see God is an accurate translation of who He is? You know, all the time in the news, we see, well, from time to time in the news, we see the media blow up over certain things in church life and, and certain things. And if we focus on that, we can actually do ourselves a disservice because we're actually losing God in the translation of what someone else is presenting. So how? How do we ensure that we see God in a way that is an accurate translation of who He is? You know, it's not hard. We continue on the journey of getting to know Him. If you ever get to the point where you think you have God worked out, you are in desperate trouble. I have been walking with God now for a long time, many decades, many decades, let's just say that. And He just continues to get bigger and better and more than I had thought in the beginning. And in the beginning, I thought he was pretty darn good. And now it's like, he's, there's just more to him. There's more to my relationship with him. There's more that he wants to do in and through me. There's more that he can do around me than I ever, ever thought was possible. So we continue on the journey of getting to know him. And, you know, here at New Hope, we journal. You know, we, and it's, it, there's a purpose in this. I, I don't, you know, if you do devotions, God bless you. I think that's great. If you do Bible study, God bless you. That, that's great. But what you're actually doing, and I think it's a good supplement, what you're actually doing is relying on someone else's translation. And I guess we're not fearful here. If you read the Bible and you feel like it is saying something to you, for goodness sake, go with it. You know, that's why we have life groups so that we can sit and we can share what we feel like God is saying to us and everybody can actually journey and learn and experience God in their own way through their own eyes, which is so much more powerful than just reading somebody else's translation, which again is a good supplement, but not the way to really get to know and understand Him. Let's not allow Him to be lost in translation in our lives. The other way I see him being lost in translation is how others see God in us. And it flows out of the first one. How we see God is how we present God to others, right? So if we are continuing to learn and to grow and not feel like we need to know it all, not feel like we have to have all the answers, we can actually take people on a journey. We can get so hung up on how we present Jesus. 
You know, I have to be a good person. I have to know scripture back to front. Well, if that is the, if knowing scripture back to front is the, is the determination, I'm out because I don't. And if you do, God bless you. But I have trouble remembering scripture references. That's why I have my little Bible app. We get hung up on it. We get, I don't know enough. I don't know enough to share him. Well, what do you do in your life? Share that. You know, and we, we just, you know, what, what can we do? How can we do it? How, how do we present it? It becomes this really difficult, hard thing to do. And, and so we either don't present him at all or we present him in a way that seems really difficult and, and hard for other people to understand. And he gets totally lost in translation. When um, Sarah and I were in the States, we went to, um, we were in LA and everyone had said to us, you must go to a football game. Now, I'm not a sporting person, but everyone said, everyone said, that we should go. And I've got to say, it was probably one of the best experiences in my life, but we were walking up and, and it's like, they do this thing called tailgating where all the families come and you know, tailgating to us means something very different. I was like, what do you mean? Are they aggressive? Do they like right up people's backs? They actually go in and they, their trucks, they put the tailgate down and they get a barbecue out and there's this immense sense of, of community as they barbecue and they sit there and they drink and they chat and they're all in the car park and, and you know, in the game, there was this sense of, you know, they really take this stuff very seriously. It's serious. But there's this sense of camaraderie and, and family. And to me, it was just a fantastic experience. But on the way in, because we'd had some dramas understanding the system of how to get our tickets. So we had to walk literally 300 miles around this place to find out what we were supposed to be doing and where we were going. And then we're nearly barred from entry because we didn't have transparent bags. Who knew you needed a transparent bag? But anyway, that's beside the point. In our circumnavigation of the Colosseum, it was called. Um, that's what it was called, wasn't it? Yes. Um, we encountered people like this. Where's that photo? This was the, cr this was the message <laughs> outside. Not only did they have, this is not actually them. I, had, I didn't film them because I didn't want to give them the satisfaction. But this was the tone. They had microphones in which they were shouting things like, you know, if you don't repent, you're going to burn in hell for the rest of your life. And I'm like, such a compelling message. <laughs> that would make me want to know Jesus. He wants to toast me if I don't. Um, and so we, we, I was just like, how? This is this amazing event. It made me so very sad that such an amazing, good, kind, loving, generous, accepting God had been translated into Jesus Christ is angry with the wicked every day. I was like, man, that is so bad that someone would present that. You know, I'm like, I'm thinking through my framework, we could give free water. You know, we could, we could, there's people everywhere trying to make money, take driving people back to their cars because we walked 300 miles. I wore a hole in my foot walking. Um, it was my fault. I wore new shoes. Don't, don't, it's not nobody's fault but mine. But I'm like, wow, the way that God is being presented is so lost in translation. And I read yesterday that Barna, the Barna Research Group has done a survey recently about what people who are not of faith are looking for in conversations that they have with people who have faith. And it was really interesting. The number one thing that people of no faith are looking for when interacting with people of faith is someone who will listen without judgment. I'm like, the number one thing, I can do that. I can listen without judgment. That's not hard. I don't even have to know scripture to listen without judgment. And then the number two thing is someone who is honest about their doubts. Well, man, I can do that. I have doubts. I can listen without judgment and I, I, can, I can be honest about my doubts and my failings. Number three is someone who does not force a conclusion. People do not want to be forced into, so I've presented it to you. Are you going to choose life or are you going to burn? Oh my gosh. I'm like, oh my goodness. Anyway, sorry. And then number four is who cares about them as a person. 
And I'm like, if that is the way, if it's so simple, this is how we present Jesus. We listen without judgment. We're honest about where we're at. Um, we don't force someone to bring, come to a conclusion because we understand that people are on a faith journey. And then we care about them as a person. Wow. That's pretty easy to translate, isn't it? We are simply called to be an authentic reflection of who God is in our lives. That's it. Who's God in your life? Scripture says we're a light on a hill, a beacon of light, a beacon of hope. And I've shared before about my friend Phil, who's going to come to church one day, just by the way, not that I'm forcing him. He just keeps telling me, I'm going to come to your church one day. I met Phil on a Sunday morning outside my favourite coffee shop and I was dressed up because I was speaking and he was like, what are you doing? And I said, oh, well, I'm working today. And he said, who works on a Sunday? And I said, me. And um, he said, what do you do? And I said, <clears throat> I'm a pastor. And whenever I say that, I kind of wait because it's usually like, sometimes they're expletives. But, you know, often it's just total shock and you've got to let them recover. And he's like, oh, so you're in the business of like saving the world. And I'm like, oh, dear Lord, no, that's not my job. And he's like, what's your job? And I said, I just feel like my job is to bring life and hope to everybody I encounter and leave people in a better place than where I found them because that's exactly what Jesus did for me. So that's my job. And he's like, I like that. That was months ago. Now he seeks me out. He tells everybody in the coffee shop that I'm his spiritual advisor. <laughs> we've had, um, he started off at your em eminence. So we've actually progressed to your, his spiritual advisor. But, you know, I found that, you know, he's like, I'm a spiritual person. I said, I'm sure you are, as am I. And we've had some really good conversations where I've been able to, without judgment, expressing my doubts, you know, being honest about who I am, not bringing him to a conclusion, just talk about what God's done in my life. And he keeps saying to me, I'm going to come to your church. Where is it again? I'm going to come to your church. So when he comes, I'm going to get him up here and say, this is Phil, because you'll all know him. <laughs> He's great. But Scripture says we're a light on a hill, a beacon of hope and life. Can you be that? I can be that. I can actually just simply reflect what God has done in my own life. What attracted me to faith in the beginning was not a whole lot of people who knew Scripture, but it was an authentic love and acceptance, a grace, peace, hope, life, purpose, which were all lacking in my life and I didn't feel like I deserved. That's what attracted me to faith in the first place. And that's what I've determined and we need to determine to be in the world around us. Instead of trying to, to translate God, let's simply reflect who He is in our own lives. Let's determine not to let God be lost in translation, but simply reflect the goodness of God that you've experienced. If you can't remember the goodness of God that you've experienced, then you've got some homework this week. Go and think about how your life has changed since you've been walking with Jesus. Go and, and, and spend some time thinking about your family and, and what you're doing and, and the love and, and how, that, how that positions you to, to be secure and to keep going on the journey and viewing life and, and looking after the world and looking out for others. Go sit with that for a bit and then reflect it. I've got a couple of questions. Is that good? Are you good? Good. Um, I've got a couple of questions to finish with. Is how I see God static? Did I meet God once and leave Him in the box? Is it static? Or am I allowing myself to grow and journey with Him? You know, as I said before, I've, no, I've been walking with Jesus for decades now. I have just found that he more and more becomes more like what I'd hoped he was in the beginning. And that reality in my life is, is so amazing. He becomes bigger and better and kinder and closer than what I ever could have really hoped to imagine in the beginning. So can I just encourage you, don't let God become static in your life. I know God. Well, great. I mean, I've met people once, but I can't say I know them. I know people that I continue to journey with and do life with. And so is God, is how I see God static or am I allowing myself to grow and journey with Him? Don't let one experience, one bad experience, 
with someone who was on a journey just like you, who maybe didn't have a good translation of God, affect your journey with God to the point that it would hold you up from experiencing that. Number two, how do those around me see God in me? You know, I think I've been privileged because I've had to explain it to people. You know, Phil's question was a great question. I was like, wow, no, that's not my job. So how do those around me see God in me? Is it, do they see that evidence of goodness of God in my life? Or am I always complaining about what I don't have? Do they see peace and joy and hope and life and purpose? Or do they just see someone that is disgruntled and upset about everything that's going on around and continues to repeat negative narratives? You know, it challenges me to think that. How do people, you know what I found? I found that people see God in me in ways that I think are quite insignificant. They see God in me when I prefer other people. And I'm not doing it so they would see it, but I see it a lot in the coffee shop I go to where I'm like looking and thinking, oh, it's it's full and I've been here for an hour sitting on one coffee. So, you know, I might just, and I'll say, hey, my table's coming up. And they see that and they don't see, oh, Sue's such a nice person, because I'm really not. I'm just aware. Um, They see God in that. They say, that is so kind. Well, kind is an attribute of God. That is so good. Well, good is an attribute of God. You are so loving. Well, that is an attribute of God. That's what they're seeing in me. They're not seeing me. They're actually seeing the evidence of God's goodness in my life. And the last one is this. Okay, in answer to those first two questions, what needs to grow and change in your life? You know, it's something that I, we used to joke about this years ago, but I want to be buried not immediately, but when I'm buried, when I'm buried, I would joke and say they're going to put like a learner's plate on my, on my headstone because all of my life I've wanted to just be a learner. I just want to learn more about Jesus. So I want to grow. I want to understand. I don't want to become fixed in what I think I, because I think God is so much bigger than what I can understand. I don't want to get hung up on disappointment or offence. I just want to learn how to grow and become an accurate reflection of what I've found in my own life. So what needs to grow and change? It's not, it's not meant to be judgmental. It's just a really good exercise. What can I do this week in my workplace that will actually more, more effectively reflect what God, who God is in my life? Do I just need to be kind to the really annoying person that, that everyone hates and doesn't talk to? Do I, do I need to just take the time with the person who talks about the same thing over and over and over again? There's a man in my coffee shop who I'm not going to name who... He honestly has the same story every week. But you know what? I'm really convicted that everybody else doesn't listen to him. But I do. Not every day, but once a week. He sits with me and he tells me the same story and I say yes. And he says, have I told you the story before? And I say, yes, it doesn't make any difference. He just wants to be listened to. Maybe it's just, it's not hard to be an accurate reflection of who God is in your life. So let's go on into this week determined to simply reflect the goodness of God in our own lives and to others. You know, we may never see the impact of that, but we can be sure if we reflect God to others and allow Him to do what He does, the impact could actually be limitless. If we can let go of that need to know, then God can do exactly what he wants to do. I wanted to finish with a quote that I read this morning from Oswald Chambers. And it's this. I feel as if it will be overwhelming one day to see what God has wrought. And one will only be sorry to not have trusted more utterly. So just go on praying and believing and we will surely find that God is doing His wondrous things all of the time. And our responsibility simply to reflect that, simply to trust and reflect that. Why don't we stand? I'd love to pray with you today. I hope that was helpful. Was that helpful? Lord, we just thank you today. We thank you that we are all on this journey together. Lord, and together as a church family, we commit today 
to, to being an accurate translation of who you are in our own lives, continuing to grow and, and to lean in and to spend time with you and, and really know who you are and continue on that journey. And Lord, also to, to be an accurate reflection of what you've done in our lives to those around us, Lord. And I just thank you today. I thank you for those today who have maybe been stalled on their journey because something has happened that has been an inaccurate translation of you. I pray today that that would be released in Jesus' Name. I pray, Lord, that we would all continue to keep moving on without fear of right, being right or wrong, just wise, just continuing on, facing you, learning about you, leaning into you and knowing that you are good and there is evidence of your goodness everywhere we look. In Jesus' Name, Amen.